Good news from the graveyard. He's not dead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, I see he the living among the dead. There was a resurrection, just like you said. help you today if you want to be a soul winner and you're going to deal with people I tried to get to this Wednesday night and never got around to it if you're going to be a soul winner and you're actually going to make attempts to open up the word of God and talk to people about Jesus Christ you're going to run in to opposition okay they're going to oppose you. They are not eagerly sitting in their living room waiting on you to show them they're a wicked sinner and go to burn in hell. And they don't want to know that anything they're doing is sin. They want to think that they're okay. And in God's eyes, they're the best person that ever lived. And God, why would not God want somebody so wonderful as them in heaven with them? Right? right? And you've got to strip all that away. That's what preaching does. It peels the bark off their tree and exposes them. They don't want that. The world don't want to know what they're doing is wrong, right? I mean, a man's running off with a secretary today to some foreign island, and he's going to have a good time. He don't want to know that it's wrong. He don't want conviction. He don't want guilt. He's probably got something to try to cut the, the conviction of his conscience. People are doing that. That's why they drink. That's why bars are full of people crying in their drinks. Why? They're trying to drown conviction and convince themselves they're okay when they're not. You understand? And when you go knocking on people's doors, their lives are a wreck. They're probably in debt. They're probably marriage is a mess. They're who knows what's going on. And, and they do not want you to come in and put the spotlight on what's going on. So when you do get this open door and you do bring up God and you do ask certain questions when you're soul winning and you sit back and say, if you were to die tonight, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you'd go to heaven. You open the door, there, you're going to get a response. Like, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I ain't got time for that. Uh, you understand? And then you could say, well, when is a good time to talk about that? Uh, basically, never. Right? And, but you're going to ask questions. And then if you get down to it, and I've told you this, you take a clipboard, go downtown. The average person goes say, I've been baptized. Almost every church creed out there believes in baptismal regeneration. I don't know how they get so many people to line up to go in and get baptized in water and convince them that's salvation and then still be able to tell them you're really not saved until you get to heaven because your good still got to outweigh your bad. You still got to live it. You still got to keep it. And that getting baptized is just one of the many steps in the process of getting saved. Well, most people, what you're going to do is you're going to come to the book of Acts and you're going to come to Acts 2. In Acts chapter number 2, this is their baby. This is the main thing that they use. They use verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were what? Pricked in their heart. That's conviction. They're, they realize they're wrong and something stuck them, right? Okay in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's works, right? Nobody there asked how to be saved. Now we read the other night in Acts 16.30, it says, men and brethren, or no, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Nobody here is asking to be saved. Now, when you deal with these Pentecostals, and you deal with the church of Christ, and they're all dealing with this verse, when you come to the next verse, verse 38, they all teach that that says, what must we do to be saved? Does it say, what must we do to be saved? Men and brethren, 
What shall we do? Now, let me ask you a question, okay? Why did they ask that question? Well, Peter's done preach to them. These 12 men get up and preach, and they're speaking in a language that they understand, and they go, oh, boy. They hear it. They hear the wonderful works of God. Peter stands up, and he preaches to them. And they're asking what to do with the message that Peter preached. They're not asking to be saved. No. That's not what... They murdered their Messiah. Right? Look at what it says here. He says, uh, he talks about Jesus, verse 21, And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men in, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, that's Israel, as ye yourselves know also, him being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands ye have what? Crucified and slain. You see that? Do you see what they just said? See, they're wanting to know what to do about Jesus Christ, whom they've crucified and slain. See, Peter's convincing them that Jesus Christ came here. He did signs. He did wonders. He did miracles, right? He was approved of God. But they took him, and they slew him and killed him. They murdered him. That's what they're asking in verse 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? We're guilty of having this man killed. See, what happens is three times a year, the Jews, according to Deuteronomy 16, 16, came to Jerusalem to observe the feast. And the chief priest, amen, stirred the people up when they came into town at Passover for first fruits, unleavened bread, and Passover. He stirred them all up, got them all worked up, right? And convinced the multitude to compel Pilate to have Jesus crucified. See, the multitudes are there. They're, this thing's going on, the chief priest. And they're getting it all stirred up and worked up. Okay? Now, 50 days later, they're back in town again for the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. And, and they're all gathered around. You understand? They're coming in to observe the feast. And while they're there, the Holy Ghost comes on upon these 12 men, and they begin to speak. And then Peter stands up and begins to preach. And when he begins to preach, he gives them a message. And he talks to the multitude that 50 days earlier had Christ crucified. Now he's pinning it right down on them. You guys are the murderers and betrayers. You understand? Let's go back to... Uh, verse 23 in Acts 2, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, who's he talking to? The Jews. He's talking to Israel. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch who? David. David's mentioned in 25, mentioned in 29, mentioned in 34. He's talking to the nation of Israel, talking to Jews. Uh, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn uh, with an oath to him of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne seeing he seeing that he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither did his flesh see corruption this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the father the promise of the Holy Ghost he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear and for David 
is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord shall set unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of who? Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now they're seeing the supernatural work of God. They're seeing a sign right there that he's speaking to them with another tongue. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Men of other tongues shall speak unto you. Listen, these people are speaking with a different language, right? They're not speaking in an unknown tongue. They're speaking in what they hear. Acts chapter number 2, they hear them speak the wonderful works of God in their own language wherein they were born. It's a miracle. God told them in Mark 16, he says, if you'll believe, you'll go and you'll speak with new tongues. Peter and them are speaking in a new tongue. They're speaking in a language those people were born in. They were Jews born in a foreign land, right? But they're there to observe the feast, right? And now they're guilty. God's raised this guy up. He went to hell. Why'd he go to hell? Yeah, he, dr he dropped off our sins there, right, and their sins, right? And then on the cross, he suffered their hell, didn't he? He said, I thirst just like the rich man in hell. He paid the price, right? He suffered our death and our hell, amen, and our pain and our anguish for our sins. He did it for theirs, and God raised him up, right? Now he's seated and exalted on high. These men are sitting there going, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were what? pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What? About murdering this man. We're guilty. The gospel's not preached. Of The gospel of Paul is not preached in Acts 2. They didn't ask how to be saved. They're not even thinking about heaven and hell. They're worried about we got blood on our hands for having this man murdered. How are we going to get out from under this? What do we do about this? We're in trouble with God. You understand? So Peter says what? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Repent of what? No. <laughs> of the murder they just committed. You need to turn. You need to change your mind about Jesus Christ. Right? Isn't that what repentance is? The prodigal came to himself. Right? He said, how many of my brethren or my, my father have hired servants and I perish with hunger? He said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to go to my father and I'm telling him I've sinned. Right? So he's got to change his mind. He's got to change his heart. He said, I'm going to rise up. And I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say, Father, forgive me for I've transgressed. Thee. No more worthy to be called thy son. He's got to change his heart. He's got to change his mind. And then he did what? He arose. He got up and did something about it. He had a change of will. You know, what they're, you know what they need to do? They need to repent. They need to take God's side against herself and realize we did murder Jesus Christ. We are guilty of having this innocent man turned over to be slayed and murdered. They have no idea that it was for their sins. They have no idea about the shed blood, the blood atonement and why he died. That's not even mentioned in the passage. They have no earthly idea. You understand? But everybody takes everything else that Paul wrote and everybody else wrote and they make the whole Bible line up to Acts 2. They make all the gospel. Paul, the one that wrote the gospel and tells us what the gospel of the grace of God is, hadn't even been saved yet. This has got nothing to do with what everybody's trying to make it to be. You need to repent. You need to have a change of heart, change of mind, and change of will toward God about what you did with Jesus Christ. You need to be sorry you murdered that rascal, right? Be, and then what? Be baptized, every one of you, how? In the name of Jesus Christ. You know what they need to do? They need to take God's side. They need to take God's son. When you come over here, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. You need to do it in the name of the one you just crucified. You're taking him. You're receiving him. Right? You say, I murdered him. I'm guilty. Right? I take him. You understand what, what's going on right there? It's identification. Listen, John came baptizing, right? John shows up and he says what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven's what? At hand. That's the gospel of the kingdom. We're not doing that. That's not for us. That's for Israel. 
They were offered a kingdom. The Gentiles weren't offered a kingdom. <laughs> you know what the Gentiles were offered? To be wiped out. <laughs> right? Or to be hewers of wood and haulers of water. If we'd proselyte. That's not a, mess, that's not a message of hope. Acts 2 is not a message of hope for a Gentile. That's not a Gentile message. It's a Jewish message. Because you know how many people are preaching to Gentiles out there today? You need to repent. What? A murder in my Messiah? Oh, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. For what? Look at what it says. For the remission of sins. Now, is that because your sins have been remitted or in order to get them remitted? Everybody teaches that if you repent and you get baptized in Jesus' name, you will get the forgiveness of sins. That ain't what it's teaching. For the remission of sins. Let me ask you a question. If I arrest you for stealing today, for stealing, is that in order that you can go to jail to steal or because you have stolen? Pretty simple, ain't it? Their sins were always remitted in the Old Testament. God forgave them over and over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Right? When they'd come and they'd confess their sins and they'd lay their hand on that sheep or that goat, right? And they'd confess their sins and the high priest would slay that sacrifice and he'd take the blood in before the, the, the mercy seat and he'd sprinkle everybody and everything, amen. And he went in there and he had the blood on the thumb and the toe and it right here. And he goes in there and he sprinkles all that blood and the high priest come out. You know what that told Israel? God forgave them. But they were never cleared Right? This ain't talking about clearing their sins. They're want, they're, the God forgives sins all the time in the Old Testament. God remitted sins all the time, but he never redeemed Israel. Let me, let me read something to you Doc says. He says, He says, uh, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Let's see. The, the key word is for for. The standard understanding of the phrase for the remission of sins is in order to get your sins remitted. But it can't mean that at all. How do you uh, know that it is to be so? Let's look in Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. It's not in order to get your sins forgiven. That's the standard teaching everybody tries to teach that when you go to Acts 2, for the remission of sins is in order to get them forgiven. Romans 3.25, to whom God has set forth to be what? A propitiation. That is the payment. Through faith where? In his blood. He declares his righteousness for what? The remission of sins that are past. You understand? Because they've been remitted. He's applying the blood to them. Listen to this. Well, if the sins were in the past, Old Testament, then God's righteousness through the blood atonement of Christ wasn't declared in order to remit them, for they were already remitted. You see, when the writer of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood there is no remission, Hebrews 9.22, that is not referring to the blood of Christ. Right? Hebrews 9.22 talking about the blood of bulls and goats. He said, without the shedding of blood of bulls and goats, right? Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. In the context, in Hebrews 9, he's talking about the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament. God forgave them in a temporary basis through the blood of an animal, but that's not referring to the blood of Christ in Hebrews 9.22. But everybody makes it that. You understand? Now watch what it says. Read the context. It is the blood of bulls and goats that sanctified the people in the tabernacle. Hebrews 9, 13, 19, and 21. The blood, that blood brought remission but could not take away sins. Hebrews 10, 4. God forgave thousands in the Old Testament remission without clearing the guilty redemption. The difference between clearing and forgiving is the difference between redemption and remission. Right? Because he had no basis for taking away sins until the Lamb of God came. 1 John 1, 29, that says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world and shed his blood. Hebrews 9, 14. Let's go to Hebrews 9, 14. 
Hebrews 9, 14. There, there's something in there that's fantastic. And what happens is, is people get lost in this thing and they read it to imply it, interpret it to themselves instead of seeing the setting, the context, how it's aligned, to whom it's talking to. You understand? You can grab anything out of the Bible and preach anything you want. That's why we got millions of different beliefs. Look at verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal what? Redemption. Didn't say eternal re remission, did it? For us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and of the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifying the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ you through the eternal spirit without spot to God what? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. They were never taken away in the Old Testament. They were temporarily rolled back. They were forgiven. They were remitted, right? But they weren't redeemed. There was no permanent, eternal redemption, a clearing, taken away of their sins. Let me show you another place. Let's go to Psalm 32. Verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is what? Forgiven, whose sin is covered. They're not cleared. It's not removed, it's just covered. Do you see that? Amen. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Do you see, you see what that says? They're, they're just temporarily covered. Listen, God was merciful and he'd allow the blood of bulls and goats and he'd forgive them and he'd cover their sin. But me and you needed our sins what? Taken away. John said over there in John 1 29, he says over there, uh, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Do you understand? And so uh, all these people think that you've got to get baptized in Jesus' name in order to get all your sins forgiven. They, they were forgiven. You understand? Watch this. Uh, let's go to ex, Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Verse 7. God's passing by talking to Moses. Verse 7, keeping mercy for who? Thousands. Forgiving what? Iniquity, transgression, and... Isn't that a blessing? See, God forgave it in the Old Testament, didn't he? How did he get, how'd they get forgiven in the Old Testament? It wasn't eternal salvation. They weren't putting their faith into Jesus Christ. Well, they're looking to the cross. No, they weren't. Look at what it says. And that by no means will what? Clear the guilty. You see that? They never cleared. Never, God never had a basis to remove them. He would just cover them and forgive them. They were remitted, but they weren't removed until Christ came. And then he purged them. He removed them. He cleared them. How? Through the blood of his son. That's not being preached here in Acts 2. Acts chapter number 2. Watch this. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, not in order to steal, but because they are. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Gabriel bought a new car and he jumped for joy. Now, when you jump for joy, do you jump to get joy or because joy has come and has flooded your heart? Right? Right? I'm going to jump. Maybe joy will come if I just jump. No, but when you get happy, <laughs> right? Hits the home run, your team wins, everybody jumps up off the couch. They're jumping for joy. Why? Because joy has come. Not in order to get joy, right? So that's what they're trying to... They put the emphasis in the wrong place. Forced remission of sins. It's because they are. So how do you know that? Anybody know what Luke 23, 34 says? Luke 23, 34. 
The Bible says in verse 33, when they come to a place which is called Calvary, they crucified him there, right? And while Jesus hang on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know what to do. Christ forgave them, but they weren't redeemed because they haven't received the redemption, have they? Right? Amen. Now watch this. And if you'll do that, see, baptism had, was a picture of purification. They believed that you had to go in and be purified through water. You understand? And we can cover some of that. I'm trying, I'm getting too far, too much into this deep study. But they, they associated water baptism with purification. That's why they thought this was washing away their sin. You understand? The water purification in uh, Numbers chapter 19. The waters of separation. But they were forgiven. And now if they would repent of murdering their Messiah, God had already put that away if they would receive that. And if they took the baptism amen, in Jesus' name, God would give them what? Look at what it says. The gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you a question. You know what the gift of the Holy Ghost is? You have any idea what the gift of the Holy Ghost is? Okay. Huh? The gift of the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, all you Pentecostal people out there all believe that, well, you've got to get the initial evidence. The initial evidence that you received the Holy Ghost is speaking in another tongue. That's the gift. No, the Holy Ghost is the gift. And that He's going to come inside you. When He comes inside you, He seals you under the day of redemption, right? We know all that revelation because Paul gave it to you, but they're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Who is actually the Holy Ghost? It's the Spirit of Christ coming inside you, right? The one they murdered. And they're going to receive Him. How? Through water baptism. By repenting for their sin, God forgave them. If they'd received Jesus Christ, they'd get the Holy Ghost, right? Now watch what it says. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as they, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words, he did testify and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Amen. Then they that gladly what? Received his word were baptized. They had to be baptized, right? They had to repent. They had to be baptized in Jesus' name. Their sins were remitted. And then if they would repent and be baptized in Jesus' name, God would give them the Holy Ghost. Is that what he said? Huh? Am I, am I making myself clear? I'm not trying to mess you up. Right? Now watch the difference now. Go to Acts 10. This is to Jews. Acts chapter number 10. Peter's now going to Gentiles. Peter believes that now he has to go and lay hands on these people to give them the Holy Ghost. He preaches to them. Verse 38. How God anointed Jesus the Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom, he sl whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly to all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it was he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all uh, prophets witness that through his name, whosoever is baptized in his name and repents shall receive what? Huh? It didn't say it, did it? He didn't quote Acts 2.38 there. It, the message has changed. See, when you're going to deal with all these people who believe in Acts 2.38, say, I want you to do something for me, sir. I want you to go to Acts 10 and read it to me. And what they do is they take Acts 2.38 and they make Acts 10.43 become Acts 2.38. Well, Peter's implying, Peter's insane. 
Peter is preaching to a different group of people about a different message. Do you understand? He says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Right? While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which what? Heard the word. They didn't get the Holy Ghost by being water baptized, did they? They got the Holy Ghost by believing. Now watch what happens. And they, they of the circumcision, that's Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues, magnified God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost? What? As well as it. they got the Holy Ghost without being water baptized. In Acts 2, you had to be baptized to get the Holy Ghost, and you had to be baptized in Jesus' name. That was a Jew who had to identify himself with Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 48. Watch this. And he commanded them to be baptized how? In the name of the Lord. God the Father's Lord, God the Son's the Lord, and the Holy Ghost is Lord. You understand? Baptize them in the name of the Lord. People think that you're going to sit back and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What is the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost? It's the Lord. Right? All three of them are Lord. Y'all looking at me funny. You never heard that before, have you? Right? God the Father's the Lord. Right? Jesus Christ the Lord. Let me show you where to hold. go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. They're all Lord. One God, three persons. Right? Verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right? And then he says, But we all with open face, beholding as, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, amen, into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the, the Lord is that Spirit. See, the Holy Ghost. They're all Lord, right? So they baptized him how? In the name of the Lord. Not the names. The name. What's the name? The Lord. You understand? So they all believe you specifically got to baptize him in Jesus only. Listen, there's three people. There's Father, there's Son, there's the Holy Ghost. Right? They manifest themselves in three different ways, three persons, the Godhead. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So I'm just trying to show you there's a change here in Acts 10. Go to Acts 2, you got Jews. Then you got Acts 10, you got Gentiles. It's an Italian band. In Acts 2, they repented. They were baptized in the name of Jesus, right? Right? To receive the Holy Ghost. That happened. Right? Then you go to Acts 10, he says, you know what? You just got to believe. And you'll get the remission of sin. And guess what happened? The Holy Ghost fell on them without anybody saying anything. You understand? Without water baptism, without the laying on of Peter's hands. Now watch this. Acts 15. You got to be able to take these people to these passages of Scripture. And they got to see that there is something that happens. When I did this video with Dwayne, and I'm trying to explain this to him. I said, Dwayne, the problem is they get to Acts 2, they hit verse 38, they stop. They make all the Bible line up to Acts 2, verse 38. They don't see that the book of Acts is a transition book and things are changing. You're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You're going from the nation of Israel, amen, to uh, uh, the church. They're going from law to grace. They're going from the head apostle Peter to to Paul. You're going from signs and wonders to the Word of God. They don't want to see the transition that's changing because God set Israel on a shelf because they rejected. Yes, 3,000 accepted them, but as a whole, the nation, millions rejected. You understand? Now watch this, Acts 15, verse 1. 
And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said on them, Except ye be circumcised, works, after the manner of Moses, law, you cannot be. Now, see, now we're talking about salvation. You understand? Barnabas had no, and then when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this. Boy, they had, they had a blowout, man. They had a knockout. Drag. I don't think you ought to argue about the Bible. They did. They were arguing. They had no small disputation. You know what that means? It was a big one. Man, they had a knockdown, drag out, blast. I mean, they got into it. Verse 3, And brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy in all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them, but there rose up certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, works, and command them to keep the law of Moses. Now you've got to do something to stay saved. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll believe they got saved, but now you've got to get them circumcised, and then you've got to keep the law of Moses, and you got to, see, so now you've got two camps there. You've got one camp that says you've got to do something in order to get saved. Then you've got another camp that says now that you're saved, you've got to do something to stay saved. You see that? So you got two camps, right? Well, actually, you got three. <laughs> you got the ones that's going to straighten out the matter and tell you what it's about. Look at what it says, verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been what? Much disputing. Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and be baptized. Believe. See, you understand? They, they want to add baptism to everything they see. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts. How? By faith. No water. Their hearts are not purified by water. Their sins are not washed away by water. It's purified by faith. They won't get it because they don't read. They're trying to make the Bible line up to their doctrine. I'm not trying to make the Bible line up to my doctrine. I'm just reading you what it says. Right? Amen. Your hearts are purified by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved if we get water baptized and circumcised and keep the commandments and eat the proper diet and not have pork. None of that stuff's in there. But people read the Bible and they cram it all up in there. Strip it all away. Make it simple. No water baptism for salvation. No circumcision for salvation. No keeping to the Sabbath for salvation. What do you do? You receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and trust Him and that's God's grace. God will give you His unmerited favor that you did not earn or can earn. Amen. God will give you that amazing grace. Why? Because you exercise faith in His Son by believing, trusting. Do you see that? Peter says one thing in Acts 2, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive to get the Holy Ghost. The requirement in Acts 2 to get the Holy Ghost was to repent and be baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. That was something they had to do. The Jews had to do. Right? All Peter knew was John's baptism. And John's baptism, he knew that they had to repent for the remission of sins. What? So they come forward? No, they, they got... They got baptized. Let's, let, me, let me finish reading what Doc says. He says this. In the Old Testament, they were admitted even though they weren't redeemed. Hebrews 9, 15. That means the declaration of Christ's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. God was declaring the Old Testament saints righteous. That is, uh, their sins were completely taken away because their sins had been remitted in the Old Testament. So the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins was baptism because a Jew had repented and God had forgiven his sins. You see that? The baptism of repentance for remission of sins was because a Jew had repented and God had forgiven his sins. 
If a criminal goes to prison for murder, is he going to prison in order to murder? But because he murdered, past tense, someone, in the sense of being a testimony of something God has already accomplished, in the sense of something, being a testimony of something God has already accomplished for or in a person, the baptism of John and the bat believer's baptism in the New Testament are similar. John's baptism showed that the Jew had already repented and received remission of sins. The baptism of the New Testament believer shows that he has already trusted Christ and received the Holy Ghost. That's what we do. It's a figure. We've repented. We've turned. We've received them. Now we get baptized because we received them and because we got their forgiveness of sins not in order to get him forgiven, but because they were. And if a Jew would repent and accept that God had forgiven his sins, they'd follow in baptism. Not in order to get their sins remitted, but that God re did remit them. Their sins were put before them. They repented. They turned to God. And God said, John said, now because you've repented, get baptized. Because your sins are remitted, not in order to get them remitted. You understand? That's where everybody messes up. So, to me, it makes plain sense. I get baptized, why? Because I received Jesus Christ. Not in order to receive Jesus Christ, right? God forgave me at Calvary. For my sins will I receive those forgiveness. You understand? Look at Acts 26. Acts 26. We got so many preachers out there that confuse it. They don't read it right, and they don't understand it, and the way they take it is wrong. And what happened is, is uh, I came forward and I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why? Because I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was lost. And when I received Him, God gave to me the forgiveness of sins, right? But so many people come forward and they say, Would you like to receive the forgiveness of sins? Come here and receive. No, they don't say come and receive the forgiveness of sins, do they? They say, you come down here and you beg God to forgive you. Right? That's what everybody teaches. You've got to come down and you've got to beg God to forgive you. God forgave me at Calvary. You understand? Do you, do you, does anybody disagree with that? At Calvary, Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for me. Right? And he said, Father, what? Forgive them. The forgiveness is there. Will I receive that forgiveness? Right? Look at Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of God on the or power of Satan unto God, that they may what? Receive what? The forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is something you receive. And we got it, we got it twisted around through all these religions out there that we somehow we must come down and cry and shed all these tears, amen, that we somehow got to beg God to forgive us. And if we sit there and just waller in our own uh, crying and shedding of tears and cutting ourselves in anguish and misery and convince God that we're really sorry, He'll offer us forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins is there. Will you take it? Right? Yes, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. God wants you to see that you have transgressed. And what it took to die to shed his blood for you and pay for your sins, yes, that ought to break your heart. But the forgiveness of sins is offered. Will you take the forgiveness? Here's what we do, right? We turn around and says, you can have, you can have a brand new car. Come on, get it, come on. Come on, get it. Come on, really show me. You really, really want it. Come on, here. You can have it. Take it. Come on. And that's the way preachers preach salvation instead of saying, there it is. Take it. It's all yours paid for. You understand? You really don't mean that. Yeah, I mean that. Sure. No strings attached. You understand? But they think you've got to jump through hoops because nobody believes anybody that's really honest because everybody's an Indian giver and they want, it. They want something in return. God says, I ain't offering nothing in return. You can have my son free and clear. I paid for it. I don't want you to burn. You're my creation. I want you to live forever. Will you take my son? 
take it. It's already been paid for. Will you receive him? If you take him, you get the forgiveness of sins. Will you receive Christ? Oh, God, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Take the forgiveness. They don't want to take the forgiveness. They want to sit back and go through some ritualistic, religious thing to try to convince themselves that they're worthy to take it. And reluctantly, they'll take the forgiveness. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) Hey, man, sign it. Well, you didn't mean it. What do you mean I didn't mean it? I took it. Well, you didn't shed crocodile tears. Who said you got to shed crocodile tears? Well, I took the forgiveness. I, I knew I was guilty. I knew I was lost. Hey, man, I know a good deal. Sign me up. I mean, when you go to the jail and, you're, and you, get a, you get a pardon from the governor, what, I mean, would you be excited? You're on your way to the electric chair and they're strapping you in and the governor walks in and says, Hey, Rob, I'll let you go free. You come over here and shake my hand. Tell me you're sorry. You say, Governor, if they'll unstrap me, I'll walk across that floor right now. I don't want to even shake your hand. I'll give you a hug and a kiss. He said, a handshake will be fine. But if you want it, you come over here and you shake my hand. I said, Judge, thank you. Well, I'd be walking out. I said, Judge, thank you. I can see people all hugging and kissing, running out the door. And say, hey, grab him, put him back in the chair. Why? He said, didn't say thank you. That's what the conditions were. You understand? People are missing the condition. What? Receive it. I wonder how many people are down at the altar just crying and begging and they're not willing to receive the forgiveness because they enjoy the process. I'll give you an example. I read a book on ins and outs of rejection. And there's people that go through this rejection syndrome. And as they go through this rejection syndrome, they can't ever accept being accepted. And so everybody that claims they accept them unconditionally, they reject it. They push them away. They said, no, nobody ever accepted me. My mom didn't accept me. Daddy didn't accept me. You can't accept me. Nothing can accept me. I don't want nothing to do with all that. But I love you unconditionally. No, 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 no. You can't love me unconditionally. Nobody can. Nobody has. Nobody will. And, and so they go. They spend their whole entire life making everybody not accept them. You understand? Why? Because they don't, they don't accept themselves, and they don't accept anybody else accepting them. And so, therefore, they won't receive acceptance. That's the same thing that happens in Christian life. There's a bunch of people that go from church to church and pew to pew. They can't ever accept the Lord Jesus Christ and His forgiveness because they deem themselves so unworthy and so worthless that they they got to push it away and push it away and push it away. And they writhe in pain and anguish and weep and cry and sling snots and they go through these big things and then people hug them and love them. And say, oh, what a performance. What great. Oh, he had to really mean it this time. And then they're back at it again. Because they're not really accepting it. They're actually rejecting it. Right? That's what hyper-Arminianism leads you to. That you can't ever really ever be sorry if you don't put on a grand performance with crocodile tears and tons of snot. And what you got to do is by faith take the, accept that God accepted you in Christ. I'm accepted where? In the beloved, not how much I cry, not how much I repent, not how much I crawl through glass. Listen, there's Filipinos every year nail themselves to crosses. They beat their backs, do all kinds of things. Amen. Uh, the Baalites cut themselves. The Muslims cut themselves and do things and draw blood. They go through these big ceremonies trying to convince God to accept them. He said, I'll accept you upon the first person of Christ. It'd be like me telling you, everybody gets in the elevator, goes to the top floor, you get a penthouse. Get in the elevator. Well, it can't be that easy. You've got to be tricked to it. And there's people over there at the counter trying to be convinced. And a bellhop standing there said, going up. And then you walk in and some guy says, you mean if I go in that elevator and I take it to the top, I get the penthouse? Yeah. Let's go for a ride. Come on, Mom. Well, I don't know about that. She pulls you out of the elevator. Well, <laughs> right? That's what people do. It can't be that easy and they pull you back. Next thing you know, you come down in a brand new suit, man. You 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 got keys to a new car and everything. So what happens? Man, I got in the elevator. I went to the top, and man, I got all these riches and all the food and the buffet. Man, I could see the whole city. I got everything indoor swimming pool, man. Now I got a brand new Rolls Royce to ride around in, man. I mean, I got it made. All I had to do is get in the elevator and take a ride. All I had to do is believe it was up there waiting for me. 
And now I'm up there in the penthouse, man. I am living high in the hog. Why? Because I took the owner at his word. And he said if I would get in the elevator without questions asked and by faith right up to the top, I could have it all. That's what God said. If you'll come down and take my son, I'll give it all to you. I said, really? I'll take that. And I got it, man. And then people said, well, I watch your life. You don't look like you really got it. <laughs> Let's go to first, first Peter. First Peter chapter number 3. I'm trying to talk about all these people that believe in baptism will save you. Okay? They had to get water baptized to get the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. In Acts chapter number 2, or Acts chapter 10, they, they just believed and they got the Holy Ghost. And now I get saved and I get the Holy Ghost by faith in Acts 15. Right? And my heart's purifying. And I'm saved by grace, right? There's a transition. Now Peter writes about it. You would think if Acts 2.38 was the theme of the Bible and that was the plan of salvation, you would think Peter would write about it. Well, let's see what he says in Acts, or, uh, 1 Peter 3. Verse uh, 20. He said, uh, Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of... Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved, how? By water. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. Did them, old, them eight souls get immersed in water? So how were they saved by water? Well, they're in an ark. They're in a boat. But how did they get saved by water? Well, they got in the ark. But how did they get saved by water? Well, they floated on the water, but how did they get saved by water? Well, they didn't get wet, but see, the flood came. They believed God. They got in the ark. The flood came, and the water took away all the wicked in all the world. The flood, the destruction took them away, right? The water purged this earth, and then they stayed in the ark of safety. They weren't immersed. The water didn't wash away none of their filth of their flesh, did not change their nature. You're right. Amen. Watch this. Verse 21. The like figure whereunto baptism, see there, it's a figure, it's a picture, doth also now what? Save us. Read the parenthesis. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. It does something to your conscience. You see that? By what? Resurrection of the dead. Baptism does also now save us. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everybody that got wet went to hell in Acts chapter, I mean, in, first, in days of Noah, here in 1 Peter. Nobody got immersed in water to get the Holy Ghost. Nobody got immersed in water to speak in tongues. You understand? When Peter's writing about water baptism years after Acts 2, verse 38, when he's writing about it, he doesn't bring up repentance. He doesn't bring up believing in the name of Jesus Christ, right? For the remission of sins. He doesn't bring that up, right? And you shall receive to give the Holy He does not bring that up. He does not read Acts 2 into 1 Peter 3. In fact, it's totally eliminated from his sermon. So Acts 2 had to be a one-time sermon to a group of people at one point in their life, and it's done. And now all these religions out there, they'll go to Acts 2.38, and they'll tell you that's the way you've got to get saved. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name, and then you get, you get the Holy Ghost, and proof and evidence you get the Holy Ghost is when He puts you under water and baptizes in Jesus' name, you come up out of the water, and you'll be speaking in an unknown gibberish that nobody can understand but God Himself. He gave you the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. And them folks are going to die and go to hell because they're placing their faith in something that's not designed for them. They won't finish the book of Acts. You understand? I hope you understand. I'm not trying to lose you. I'm trying to explain it away. And I feel sometimes when I'm trying to explain things, I muddy the water. You understand? Acts 2 is for the Jew, right, that murdered Jesus Christ at Passover. Now at Pentecost, they have a chance to get that thing right. 
3,000 souls were saved that day. They gladly received the word that Peter preached and they followed in baptism. And when they did, they got the Holy Ghost. Right? But they still had to gladly receive the message that Peter preached. They accepted it and said, you know what? We are guilty. We did murder him. And we're sorry for that, Pete. And he said, well, God's forgiven you. Now, be baptized. They were baptized. When they were baptized, followed in obedience, guess what? They got the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, they didn't have to repent of murdering their Messiah. But he talked about Jesus being murdered and the forgiveness of sins was offered. And if you'd take that, guess what? You, you know what? Cornelius said, yeah, I want that. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he convinced that unbelieving Jew that the Gentiles got it. He had to show them by speaking in tongues. And those, those converts spoke in tongues there. In Acts 2, no convert speaks in tongues. Acts 10, the converts speak in tongues. And in Acts 19, the converts speak in tongues. Why? Because there's unbelieving Jews all around them. And those folks were baptized in John the Baptist baptism. They're already immersed in water. And guess what? That wasn't good enough to save you. And they believed, and that still wasn't good enough to save you. And then Paul had to show them, so he had them baptized, get the Holy Ghost, and convince the unbelieving Jews around them that they got it. But then all that stuff disappears. And now it's Acts 15, what? You purify your hearts, how? By faith. And then that's how you get God's grace. And if you do it any other way, you're putting a yoke on people that they can't bear. You're not saved by what you do. You're not kept saved by what you do. You're saved by who you receive. And when you receive Jesus Christ, your Savior is your Lord, and you trust Him and what He did, you're in. Does that make sense? So... I'm not trying to muddy the water. Listen, it's hard to explain. It's a transition. Things are in there. What you need to realize is you need to tell them, folks, you need to read the book of Acts. Because Acts 2 and Acts 10 are not the same. And Acts 15 is not the same. And what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3 is not the same. So something has changed. Have you studied enough to know that, well, I know what happened. I got put under water and I did it in Jesus' name and I come up out of the water and I spoke in this unknown tongue and I've been filled with the Holy Ghost and I felt good, felt like electricity just running all over me. How do you know you didn't get baptized with the devil? Well, the Bible says, show me the gospel in Acts 2. The resurrection is mentioned, but it's not for remission of sins. It's not forgiveness of sins. The gospel is not preached in Acts 2. It's not there. So how do you know it's for you? There's no Christians in Acts 2. Nobody's asking how to be saved in Acts 2. How do you know it's dealing with salvation? <laughs> right? I'm just, people are in a mess. They found one thing. What shall we do? What? About murdering our Messiah is the question. Right? It's not about what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? That question comes in Acts 16. It's a transition. Things are changing. And if we don't see the change, they're going to die and go to hell. That's the sad part. I'm just trying to help you that when people come to the book of Acts, they don't want to go to the book of Romans and see how easy it is to be saved. You understand? They don't want to go to the book of John. They want to dwell in Acts. So you spell Acts, A-X. They're going to lose their spiritual head. <laughs> They're going to lose their life if they go to the wrong place in the book of Acts. Over seven different ways people got saved in the book of Acts. In Acts 8, anybody know what Acts 8, 37 is? It said, he, said, he said, what doth hinder me baptized? He said, if thou believest that Jesus is the Christ, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, he put his faith in him. And he, he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He said, upon your profession of faith, my brother, I baptize you. <laughs> right? He didn't say it quite like that, but it was upon his profession of faith. He trusted Jesus Christ with all his heart. And because he did it with all his heart, then he could follow in baptism, not in order to get saved, but because he trusted in the Son of God with all his heart. Amen? It's not in order, it's because. Father, we ask you to bless now. Thank you. Suppose
Those at night when you close your eyes You take your final breath All the years you spent here on earth Not a minute would you have left Did you ever ask the Lord to save you Ever get down on your knees and pray Do you know what you're gonna hear when you face him on judgment day? Will he say in her end, my good and faithful one? Or will he say, depart from me, I never knew you and the wicked things you've done? Final time, do you know 